Good morning and welcome to the service of worship from the Pendleton Presbyterian Church. We're glad that you are with us. For example, uh, we've had a, a little bit of a technical difficulty this morning, but we have cleared that up. So we apologize for being uh, a few minutes late in beginning the broadcast. Please uh, take the time this morning to read the announcements that are in your bulletin and participate as you have the opportunity to do so, to work within our community of faith. And please remember in your prayers to pray for our world, for those who are continuing to suffer the effects of great hurricanes down in the Gulf area, and to remember to pray for those who are experiencing the effects of this COVID-19. Let us now begin to worship by referring to our bulletins and using the prayer of confession to begin. And if you're able, please rise. Let us pray together. Blessed Redeemer, you endow us with goodness while we squander your blessings. We yearn for the possessions that our neighbors enjoy. Satisfaction eludes us as our cravings increase. Quiet our longings for material riches and help us trust in Jesus. Amen. And hear these words of assurance. And now may Christ dwell in your hearts through faith that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. With repentance comes forgiveness. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. If you would like to follow along with our hymn, it is 339. Thank you for your offering of tithes and gifts for this morning, and you may remain seated as we use the prayer of dedication to dedicate these, our gifts, to God, and let us pray together. To you, O God, be all power and glory, blessing and honor, now and forevermore. As Christ guides us, let us go forth to serve. May all that we do reveal your benevolence, and what we offer reflect your goodness. Amen. Our reading for this morning is from the Old Testament, and I shall read to you from the book of Psalms, a part of the 139th Psalm that I find to be always comforting and helpful because it reminds us that our God is present. Our God is indeed inescapable. Hear the word of God. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. 
Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle in the harshest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. This is the word of God. Thanks be unto God. And now let us join together in a moment of prayer, beginning with the prayers that you have brought with you to worship today. Let us begin in silence. And now let us join together in a moment of prayer. O God, we give you thanks for your Son, Jesus, whom we confess as our Lord. You sustain us by his word when we grow weary in our faith. You have caused your commandments to pervade his life, giving focus and direction to our attempts to obey your will. When we stumble and fall, it is he who intercedes on our behalf. He is our righteousness and redeemer, our source of hope and the anchor of our assurance. Our Lord suffered rejection and endured the cross. We approach you with boldness, with acceptance through his promise of new life. <clears throat> he is indeed the name that is above every name the one who enables and frees our tongues to confess, to give you all glory as the one true God of our lives. May our thanksgiving create endurance as we offer our lives to others in the name of Christ. There are those whose energies are sapped by sorrow, whose bodies are bent with grief. Given the gift of your spirit, may we help them to have hope. There are others who are shunned by their neighbors, cast aside as being inferior or of no use. We are encouraged by the forgiveness you give us in Christ. Let our words of acceptance offer them hope. We hear whispers of gossip, and are witness to plots that will repay still others for wrongs that they have done. Let us at those times be bold to speak words of reconciliation and peace. Keep us, we pray, from compounding the pain that is inflicted upon your people by whatever cause. Our Lord made the sacrifice once and for all, and may we, in his name, have compassion on all those who suffer abuse, joining with them in the one hope that makes all things new. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we offer our prayers, and we pray together the prayer that he gave unto us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our reading this morning from the New Testament is taken from two sections in the Gospel of Matthew, from the 26th chapter, verses 14 through 25, and then verse 66. Here again, the Word of God. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, 
The teacher says, the time is near. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he took his place with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to him, one another, Surely not I, Lord. He answered, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as is, it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. <clears throat> it would have been better for that man to never have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. And from the 66th verse, What is your verdict? They answered, He deserves death. This is the word of God. Thanks be unto God. And we pray in the spirit of our living Christ that our understanding might be added. Amen. That might seem a strange reading for us today in the fall of the year when it is usually read only at the Passover time of the year. And yet there are words of hope here and comfort here that I have found. And I wish that I will be able to share with you those this morning. For our hearts are facing great desperation in these days. Today we have uh, facing us the same sort of feeling, I think, that Jesus felt during his time of desperation. It is not easy to be alive and in the world today. We have always had our times of trouble and we have always thought about better times that we have had. We've thought about the good times that we hope will come. Commenting on the human tendency to romanticize these past times that I draw to your attention in your own life and in the life of our world, an Irishman wrote this, don't look back on the good old days. The good old days are now. And in terms of anxiety and violence or depression, loneliness and emptiness, our times do seem to be endowed with so many species of tribulation that we might wish to warn future citizens of our world against romanticizing this particular age as any good old day. Last year I read, for example, that it's reported that over 20,000 tons of aspirin were consumed in the United States, not to mention Tylenol, etc., pain relievers that are prescribed by physicians. Now that sounds to me like an awful headache a national headache, a worldly headache, if you will, and we are indeed engaged in such a headache today. And it would be easy to make jokes about it, yet it bespeaks of great pain. Our world today speaks of a deep and profound mystery of pain itself. If we think of physical or mental pain for very long, we inevitably find ourselves up against a mystery that absolutely refuses to lend itself to a solution or creditable explanation. And what can be said not only of physical pain, but of mental pain, especially that intense mental anguish that has enveloped many in our nation and in our world today, that pain that we call anxiety, often referred to as that unlocatable pain. However exclusive it may be, 
It is very real, a very real pain that immobilizes our bodies and drains our spirits. Another baffling dimension of pain to me is that the thresholds of pain vary from one individual to the next. Our tolerance for pain is as varied as our own personalities. Despite its complexities, perhaps the best definition of pain is simply, it hurts. And we hurt today. With all of the things facing us, from the masks that we have to wear, from routines that we have had for many years of our lives, we have had to change all of that. We have changed together not only that we come together as congregations, but also the way that we come together as families and certainly as friends. Now what does this recitation that I have given you about pain have to do with the gospel? From the very beginning of our Lord's ministry through the tragic events in today's gospel reading, we see our Lord Jesus drawn, if you will, as if magnetically to the pain and the suffering of others. He triumphantly entered Jerusalem and was caused by his concern and dedication, being there because of that concern and dedication to hurting people. His presence was there to affirm to them that they did enjoy God's presence in the daily routine of their lives, even though they did not acknowledge it at that moment. So when the Pharisees questioned the propriety of our Lord's easy association with what they called social outcasts, he replies, people who are well do not need a doctor. Sick people do. It seemed that Jesus, he had an unmatched in feeling for those people who were suffering. In those moments when you and I draw closest to another person's pain, we understand, even unspoken words, that that pain belongs to that other person alone. We cannot assume it for the other. We cannot feel it for the other. But Jesus breaks through that barrier that separates him from another's pain. The Son of God feels our pain, takes on our suffering, suffers with us because he physically walked this earth just the way that you and I do, and he was like us, we are told, in every way. Though he was in the form of God, Paul writes, he did not count equality with God as something to be grasped at. Rather, he emptied himself and took on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And for this reason, because our Lord emptied himself and took on the form of a servant, being born in the form of human beings, because he became one of us in every way. He shares in our predicaments, and he can turn to his disciples at that moment of his own desperation and a moment of sublime prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane and say, I am filled with sorrow to the point of death. And so the Son of God emptied himself. From his descent to human form in Bethlehem to his ascent to the cross on Calvary, remember humiliation followed humiliation. Early on even in his ministry, his own relatives and his friends judged him to be unstable, insane even. We read in Mark's gospel, they came to him and took charge of him saying, he is out of his mind. The things that he is able to do, he does because of a relationship 
with Beelzebub. The religious leaders contend then that he is possessed by a demon. When their boat is threatened by heavy seas, our Lord's disciples accuse him of being unconcerned for their welfare. He is ridiculed when he tells a group of mourners that the child over whom they grieve is not dead. He is alive. And when he foretells his final humiliation to his disciples, that he will be made to suffer and be executed, Peter tells him that he has misunderstood his own ministry. He doesn't know what he is saying. And then Judas's betrayal, desertion by his friends, Peter's denial, the arrest, the scourging, the spitting, mocking the nails, the lance, the derisive inscription on the cross, and the ignominy of being placed between two thieves. Humiliation in our Lord's life builds upon humiliation, upon humiliation in intensity. <clears throat> And it climaxes in that final, final moment when Jesus cries out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then he breathes his last. <clears throat> the Son of God empties himself. And in emptying himself, he serves his Father's will. And just as Jesus served his Father's will for us, you and I, in this world that we inhabit, that is filled with individual, national, and international desperation, are called into our Father's service to others. Jesus came into the world to bring new meaning to our pain, our suffering, because the Son of God suffered to the point of death, I believe that you and I shall not grieve in pain or in loneliness. Because the Son of God endured the agony of crucifixion, we shall not suffer in vain. Because the Son of God emptied himself so that he could fulfill the Creator's gift because he is the risen Lord, we shall not suffer in vain. The pain of loss, the pain of sickness, the pain of anxiety, the pain of humiliation, the pain of loneliness, none are in vain because you and I, if we let it, are in on the secret. The Messiah and the suffering servant of God are one and the same, and Jesus Christ is that one. Imagine, if you would, for a moment, our Lord's thoughts on that fateful day, that fateful event that began. Was it all for nothing? My coming into this world, my preaching and teaching, my miracle working, my life, my death, was it all for nothing, Father? Did you forget the promise of eternal fulfillment that you gave unto me? Is this your idea of love? My God, why? Why have you abandoned me? Why have you deserted me? These undoubtedly, if he was indeed human as we are, and he was, had to be thoughts that passed through his mind. Our Jesus identified totally with human suffering and is his supreme act of self-giving on the cross. It remains for folk like you and me to take up our crosses daily and follow Jesus. Let us follow the Lord Jesus in his loving ministry and service to others, even though we cannot 
take away. We cannot feel their pain. We can help them endure it with our presence. And in so doing, we discover that we need never to be lonely for the love of God in Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father and of the Son and Holy Spirit, amen. Now, my friends, if you would, let us say what gather what we believe. And if you would, please, and you're able, rise for the Apostles' Creed. And let the children of God repeat. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. And if you would like to follow along with the hymn, it is number 376. Will you please rise for the benediction? And now to the one who is able to keep you faultless, without blemish, and present you so, even before the throne of Almighty God, our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave unto us his peace, and I charge you to carry it with you as you depart. Bless yourself with it, and allow others to be blessed also. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.